there's this thing that drives me nuts, um, which is that people talk about like the food system is a climate problem. You know, the food system has a role in the biodiversity collapse. That's kind of like saying, you know, instead of uh, calling out, you know, the oil industry, it's like liquids are, you know, a climate problem. It's all about animal ag. Every other part of the food system is just a total rounding error in terms of environmental impact. We should forget about saying it's the food system. It's the animal ag system, it's livestock. That's the problem. That's a topic for a video. So um, it's very weird to me that um, I'm here sort of as a representative of the food industry. A little over 10 years ago, um, I was a research scientist and professor at Stanford, and I uh, was trying to decide what, what was the most impactful thing I could do um, uh, next. And as I did my research, I realized that um, number one, and I'll explain some of why this is true, um, that I, I hadn't realized it, but the most destructive technology on earth and the most destructive technology, I think, in human history is the use of animals um, to make food, to turn plants into meat and fish and dairy foods. Um, it's worse than the fossil fuel industry, and I'm happy to get into that debate. Um, and nobody was serious, no, not only was uh, um, uh, nobody seriously working on it, um, but no one was really much talking about it. We're here in Glasgow, um, primarily to talk about uh, climate change, I think it's worth saying that um, there's another issue that's very intertwined with this, and obviously Landscape Forum is very well aware of this, uh, which is that we're also in, in the late stages of a global collapse of biodiversity that is, is still progressing, has wiped out uh, more than two thirds of the wild animals that were living on Earth 50 years ago, and shows no sign of stopping. And it's almost entirely, that is almost entirely due to our use of animals as a food technology. Um, the land footprint of animal agriculture, which is about 40% of ours, when you talk about global landscapes, basically the human impact on global landscapes is animal agriculture. And that's almost full stop. All the cities on earth fit on less than 1% of ours land area. The, 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 the crops that we grow to consume directly as food, fit on about 5% of Earth's land area, and then animal ag is 40% of Earth's land area. The climate, uh, the greenhouse gases that are emitted by the fossil fuel industry or by the, the use of fossil fuels uh, as an energy system is essentially ir irreversible. I mean, you're not gonna be able to turn the carbon dioxide that came from burning oil and fossil and, and coal um, back into oil and coal. If you did it, the energy it would take to do that would create its own climate problems. It's just not gonna happen. Um, but animal agriculture is completely different. It's almost completely reversible as a cause of climate change. Why is it reversible? Because basically the, the, the biggest cause of CO2 emissions from animal, virtually the only cause of CO2 emissions from animal ag historically is that 40% of Earth's land area was cleared of its pre-existing biomass to make room for mostly cows and sheep and grazing animals as well as feed crops, okay? And in that process, the, um, the amount of biomass that was uh, um, con converted into CO2 to clear the land, this, the, the carbon content was equivalent to 22 years worth of fossil fuel emissions at the current rate. You can't turn CO2 back into coal, but you can turn it back into biomass, okay? You can literally reverse the process. And what it requires is clearing the livestock and feed crops off the land and allowing the native ecosystems to recover or allowing or actually facilitating the process of, of recovery, which is the biggest step you can take not only to um, address climate change, but also um, the, the biodiversity collapse, okay? It's reversible. There's also methane and nitrous oxide, which are powerful greenhouse gases. Um, animal agriculture is 
overwhelmingly the responsible for nitrous oxide. It's about 90% plus of nitrous oxide emissions come from animal agriculture. And about half of methane emissions um, uh, come from animal agriculture. Two minutes, okay, I can do this in two minutes. Um, the way we're approaching the problem is basically, when I found the company, I said, look, we're not gonna solve this by waiting for government or COP or the UN or anyone to solve it. I mean, we see how well that works, right? Um, this is something that requires individual action. And to be frank, it requires radical action because the, 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 the babble that's going on there is basically because nobody wants things to change much. They want to do things that don't ruffle any feathers. They don't, you know, everybody comes out. No one gets, you know, disrupted or anything like that. And yet somehow with no disruption, this radical thing will somehow mag magically happen. That's not going to be true. The, what, we're, what we're trying to do on Impossible Foods is the least radical thing we could do. It's entirely market-based, and I think it creates a great outcome for, for uh, farmers. It has to be individual action, and the only way, and the, it's absolutely critical, argue with me, we have to get rid of animal agriculture full stop as fast as possible. A quick remark. So the government was mentioned a few times uh, in this whole thing, even though it's obviously from an individual and private perspective, mostly. But I think what is looming large is the kind of political, philosophical perspective that, that you know, governments and uh, people that are politically involved, um, you know, engage in. It, it would in, uh, include something like uh, uh, how we view subsidies and what what they what they're there for, for example, uh, in Geneva, on the border on in Geneva you would have subsidy because Switzerland is one of the most subsidizing countries on the on the earth, and so you you would have uh, agriculture in Geneva where right on the other side in France you have none because it's not really um, effective in that way. So, I guess. I would like to know what you what your views or your thoughts are on that, uh, the political philosophical perspective uh, that would um, uh, that would coincide and, and that would um, go well with your approaches. I think the problem is, to be honest, it's a big problem at COP. Is that the policy making um, is dominated by the wealthy and powerful and the victims are not. This is something that requires individual action. And to be frank, it requires radical action because the, 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 the babble that's going on there is basically because nobody wants things to change much. Well, I think if you have a market-based approach, um, it doesn't compel those farmers to do anything. If, they're, if, 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 they're, if it's their own food security, to have a cow or a pig or something like that, or it's something in the local economy, it, it won't be threatened by um, you know, plant-based products that might be healthier and more expensive and, and stuff like that. If they're not accessible to those farmers, their communities, it's, 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 it, it's not gonna take away what they're doing, right? No one's gonna go and steal their cow or a pig. I would never advocate for that. The way we approach the problem is first of all, we are not trying to build something new in addition to the incumbent industry. Um, the company was founded seriously, not because we wanted to be a big food company, but because we wanted to collapse the animal ag industry um, in, the, in, in the best possible way, which is just um, take away their customers by making a better product with a much more sustainable technology, but also make something that better serves their needs as they define them. And frankly, every time we sell a product, of, I'm vegan, so I love vegans, but uh, my wife's vegan, but um, every time we sell a product to a vegan, I consider it to be a pretty much a waste because um, it, didn't, it didn't steal a customer from the meat industry. And um, I think that's just an interesting thing about food. People don't buy food because um, of the philosophical sure. you know, um, principles. They buy it because they like how it tastes and it's nutritional and it's Absolutely. affordable. In politics, we live with, we vie with, we compete against more than one model of utopian thinking. And the different modes of utopian thinking 
have to be challenged, have to be debunked, have to be overturned in different ways. Smoking. Do you think in the next 20 years we're going to eliminate cigarette smoking? And if so, how? Do you think that simply because people have access to healthier, better alternatives to smoking that they're just going to stop? Do you think that the free market left to its own devices in the next 20 years is going to achieve a cigarette-free world or a marijuana-free world? And if you do believe that, why do you think that would happen in the next 20 years? Why do you think it didn't happen in the last 20 years when people already knew that cigarettes caused cancer, that cigarettes shortened your lifespan, that cigarettes reduced your ability to just walk up a flight of stairs or even enjoy the taste of your food? Everyone's known for the last 20 years the terrible harm that cigarettes and smoking of any kind, including smoking marijuana, they've known the terrible direct harm it will do in their own lives. When I would take the train in France, every station the train stopped at, you would see people scuttling out to smoke a cigarette on the platform and then scuttling back in again. Some of them were rich and some of them were poor. They were from all walks of life. You got to see a great cross section of the nicotine addicts of our society. I used to live near a hospital and I'd walk past the front of the hospital every day and you'd see people standing in front of the, standing in a specially designated place next to an ashtray, several meters in front of the hospital. You'd see them standing there and smoking. It wasn't just patients. Doctors, nurses, highly educated people, people who don't just know about the health consequences, but people who suffer a certain level of stigma and shame and ridicule at their workplace every day. They're not working at a nightclub, they're working at a hospital, and they gotta go stand in front of the front door to smoke cigarettes. But that pressure, that level of coercion isn't enough for them to make the change. And then you scale it up and you think of all of France. And you look at the percentage of people in France who still smoke cigarettes. Oh, and it gets worse. You look at the Russians. You look at the Ukrainians. You look at southern China. You take a look around the world. When we think about utopianism and the dangers of utopian thinking, we tend to imagine left-wing ideologues. We tend to imagine people who subscribe to a coercive state-centered model of society. People who think that having better laws, better constitution, better authoritarian system of government will create a utopia despite human nature from the top down. But it is just as dangerous to believe in this libertarian fiction, this free market fiction, that these fundamental problems in our society, whether it be smoking cigarettes, eating meat, dairy, yogurt, the wearing of leather, it is just as dangerous for us to live with the delusion and propound the delusion that these massive problems on such a staggering scale can be solved or will be solved within the next 20 years just through public education making a healthier option, a healthier alternative available, giving them, giving them freedom of choice on the free market. There was a stand-up comedy routine from Chris Rock. I don't think he delivered the line very well. Maybe there's more than one version of it that exists on tape today. But he, he said uh, he's known cocaine dealers. And he just can't imagine any of these guys standing there in their hotel room with a briefcase full of cocaine, standing there and thinking, 
what am I going to do with all this crack? Who, who's going to buy it? Who's, who's going to buy this? I, I just don't know how I'm going to. You know what? I'm going to have to have a half price sale. For how many years have people known that cocaine, heroin, fentanyl don't just cause brain damage, they cause premature death? They ruin your life, and then at some point, they take your life away from you. How would you achieve a society with zero cigarette smoking? Not a 5% reduction in cigarette smoking. Absolutely zero cigarette smoking. It would take a level of coercion, a level of sang-froid that most people in Western democracies cannot imagine. What would it take to lower the rate of cocaine use, the rate of heroin use, the rate of fentanyl use in the city of Los Angeles from its current levels to just being equal to the levels of hard drug use that you see in Tokyo, Japan. It's not zero, but a dramatic reduction in hard drug use. It would take a level of coercion. It would take a level of sang-froid that I can imagine and I'm willing to commit to. And I can recognize that making the transition in just 20 years from a society that worships meat to a society that despises it, it's going to involve coercion. It's going to involve commitment. It's going to involve sacrifice. And if we're even just talking about it at a conference like this, is it too much for me to ask for some measure of realism, for some measure of sang -fuh?